Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe. I am the host and producer of the chats, which are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, I am interviewing Kilker Alcaraz. Kilker was Mr. UK Leather 2012 and Mr. Leather Europe 2012. And welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. My pleasure. <laughs> You're in Barcelona, Spain. I am, and it's, it's very hot actually today. <laughs> really? Great. It is. It's great weather. Let's start right at the very beginning. Tell me a little bit about where you're from and your family and your background. So I'm from San Sebastian, which is a city in north of Spain. It's a region called the Basque Country. It's a uh, quite close to the Pyrenees and like five minutes drive from the French border. So um, it's very like highly, it has lots of mountains and <laughs> it's rainy as well. So well, tell me a little bit about your family and your circumstances. My family, uh, uh, we're five at home. My twin brother, I have a twin brother. He's straight, let's pray. <laughs> And uh, my sister, then uh, she's five years older, and then my my mom and my dad. Uh, we all, oh, well, they all live in my village, in my hometown, along with my grandparents and, and aunts and uncles. And I have a nephew, which I'm really, really happy for. That's a new thing for me, and I'm enjoying it a lot. Uh, my parents are very supportive towards, towards all this. They can't speak English, but I'll show them the video. And, Hopefully, uh, they like it. How did you learn to speak English? Uh, I started at school, and <laughs> it will sound a little bit uh, awkward, but uh, I like like Britney Spears songs. So I used to, you know, translate the Backstreet Boys all their nineties pop bands. So uh -huh. because of curiosity, it was also my favorite subject at school, all the languages. So when you were young. How did you know about being gay? Um, the first recollection I have is <laughs> I have, we were at, at a school trip and there was this guy that uh, I was about six, five, six. That's the first recollection I have. And this guy had kind of like um, purple lips, very, very nice. And I felt attracted to, to this guy. It was very weird. So that's the first recollection I have. At what age did you come out? I came out just 10 years ago. I think uh, 2009, so 12 years ago. At 23rd of July. <laughs> oh. That was uh, so 12 years ago, uh, 23. Age 23, okay. Yeah. Okay. Tell me about coming out. I was living in the Middle East, working for an airline there, and I fell in love for the, for the first time with a Syrian guy. He probably see the video as well, <laughs> so big kids. <laughs> and it was everything like really quick and, you know, it was a big change there, living there. It was like a little bit too much. So slowly I fell in a depression and my family thought it was because I was gay and I didn't dare to tell them. So they contacted one of my friends that lives actually in Barcelona, another flight attendant, and she told me, you know, your parents contacted me. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna take a flight back, back to San Sebastian. And I flew over there. We spent like three days, you know, when you, when you actually want to open the conversation, but you don't know how, and they're the same. So it was this uncomfortable silent moments for three days. And then one day I just had like three gin tonics and I told my mom. <laughs> and the following day, uh, the following morning, my dad knocked on my door. He came and he said, eh, mom told me what you told her last night. I just wanted to let you know that I love you. So for me, it was great. I'm very lucky. <laughs> Where were you in the Middle East? I lived in Qatar, in Doha. Okay. Well, being gay in the Middle East must be very difficult. Um, you know, it, it is because everything happens indoors, but probably they'll kill me for saying it, but there is a, a big, big uh, gay community there. 
I mean, that's, you know, even, even I think even the culture is a little bit, you know, you can hold hands with men to men can hold hands, but men to women, no. So at the end of the day, you know, it's, there is ways to get around being gay. That's, I mean, the laws are strict, so it has to be undercover, everything. It was, it was the time when Grindr opened as well. So uh, we all downloaded Grindr and you had to connect to a VPN. It was a little bit, everything like this. And every time you met someone, it could, there's a risk that could be an undercover police. So it was a little bit like this, but yeah, that's the way <laughs> they live there, unfortunately, nowadays. Simple. Did you have bad experiences trying to meet people there? Uh, no, no, actually no. No, because we all hung, uh, it's a very, very small community. I'm talking about Qatar. I don't know, Dubai uh, seems to be a little more open, or Bahrain as well. Qatar is very, very small. Like Doha is, uh, I think the, the, the capital is like 200,000 inhabitants, oh. or at least 10 years ago. You know how big they span very, very quickly. And we all used to hang out through the same places and one gets to know another one and you're invited to parties. And, you know, so it was a very, very small gay community. Very, very close, all of them. So where did you go after Qatar? So after Qatar, because I, I continued with the depression and it was not getting any better. I mean, I didn't realize it was a depression until I came back uh, to my parents. Literally, I quit my job. I parked my car in the desert next to all the Lamborghinis and Ferraris. And it's actually amazing when you see all those <laughs> amazing, big, uh, expensive cars oh. in the desert, you know. And literally, I took a flight home and I came back to my parents to recover, you know, uh, the depression and stuff. <laughs> what was causing this? I think it was uh, many, many things. One, all the stress of coming out because it's never easy. Even if you suspect that your family, you know, especially like our parents, even from my generation, our parents, I mean, my generation was already quite open, but obviously my parents were educated differently. My grandparents were educated differently. I'm from a, a town that's next to San Sebastian. There's 1,500 inhabitants. And even, even though uh, people came out there before me, so I knew it was gonna be kind of okay. And I never hid it. I mean, I was very flamboyant anyway, when I was a kid, so <laughs> everybody everybody knew, you know, I, I nearly didn't even have to tell. There's some people that I never told them, you know. Um, still, it was very stressful. And then moving from Europe to Qatar, finding love the, for the first time, it was all a little bit like, too many things coming together, you know, the culture as well, the culture difference is, is huge. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know, probably I didn't realize. And yeah, I mean, it made me stronger. I'm not thankful that it happened because it was painful, but, you know, I am thankful that it happened because I am stronger and it made me the man I am today. I don't actually think that I could have been as open as a leather man or fetish man if I didn't go through that because the whole experience put me really down. And then right after, like less than a year after, the whole title thing happened. It was everything very, very quick. And that helped me to accept myself. So, you know. Tell me a little bit about the kinky and the gay scene there in Barcelona. In Barcelona, there is many, many teams that are organizing things and Luckily, there is stuff going on. We are, we're going up. Uh, I'm part of Barcelona Rubber Man. We, we organized, we started organizing uh, Barcelona Rubber Weekend kind of like seven years ago. Uh, at the beginning, it was very small, like 30 people, stuff like that. And slowly, we've grown into something like 200, we're expecting 200, 250 this year. The bad thing is that um, the venues here are very small. So very small compared to the U.S. venues. I mean, they're like 200 people, you know, the biggest one. Sex clubs, there is saunas and stuff like that, which are bigger. But venues that can cost something like this, 200, 250. Or, and then if you want to do something bigger, 
you need a lot of investment because of insurances and stuff like that. Uh-huh. Then there's other groups that uh, are doing stuff as well. And, you know, till, till not very recently, the bars as well, some bars were very adamant to kind of like host these kind of events because of that of the Spanish mentality or that, you know, there's lots of fetish people that stay at home. Actually, they, you know, they love it. I meet lots and lots and lots of them. And if they watch it, please come out. <laughs> come out to the parties because it's very social. It doesn't have to be scary. You know, people think it's something very, very sexual and that's it. And it's not like that. I enjoy, me, I enjoy more the social part rather than the sexual part, which obviously I do as well, but more in my privacy. So there's all kind of, all kind of people and what I'm happy for is that people is seeing that something is happening and they are coming up. This year we're focusing on bringing younger people and local people as well because we do have international attendees because, well, we travel a lot like, like all the fetish people, I guess, to all the big parties and stuff like that. So people come from abroad and they've been coming for, from abroad for years, but local people is a little bit more difficult. So two years ago, the last time we did the Rural Weekend was 80% foreigners and 20% locals. So we're trying to focus on bringing, you know, I mean, it's great to have like international travelers. I'm not going to complain. We're we're very grateful, but it is also good, you know, that people from Barcelona and surroundings and even from Spain, they can come to the parties and they enjoy. We also started to do something in Sitges this year for the Rural Week. And it was, we did two parties and it was actually like very, very well received. So hopefully we'll continue working with them as well. They've created a leather group, which is called Le- uh, CHS Leather Friends. Oh. And, you know, we'll, we'll support them as much as we can. Uh, Madrid as well is having uh, some parties there, Seville, Torremolinos. So, you know, fetish is, is kind of like flourishing from homes out to the bars, which is what we need, I think. That's wonderful. <laughs> It is, it is, actually. We're very grateful, very grateful. It takes a lot of effort as well, and, and it won't happen one day to the other. It takes time to build, you know, people's trust, whether it's bars or, or you know, sponsors or attendees as well. And, and it, I have to say it's not, it's not easy as well to accept, first of all, to accept your fetish, because I do think everyone has fetishes, but to accept it, that's another thing to realize what you like, then accepting it, then, you know, say, I'm going to try this. It's not easy. It's, it's, it's just as difficult as coming out. Lots of people talk about when they came out as, gay, as a gay person and when they came out as a fetish man. Yeah. It's, it's like another milestone, yeah? <laughs> well, tell us about you coming out into the fetish scene. Wow, my, mine was... Uh, so, basically, uh, I met this guy... Uh, at, in a hotel room. Uh, he was called Sly Hans. He was uh, MIR. I might get their year wrong, but it's, I, I don't know if it was 2011 or 2012. I, I uh, remember him, yes. Mm-hmm. I think it was 2011 because I met him in 2011. I think. Anyway, I met him in a hotel. Uh, he was sleeping at the airport and I was staying in that hotel for work. So I told him, come over. Um, you know, let's let's have a chat if you need a bed. Because we, by by law in the UK, we used to have two double beds. And when we chatted through Scruff, he was very very kind. And I thought, okay, come to the room. He actually made me <laughs> made me dress in full rubber because at the time I only owned leather. Yeah, in full rubber, like top to bottom, everything, everything with a gag in my mouth, everything. And I actually thought, oh my god, I I will never like this. I mean, how wrong I was how wrong I was. And then he told me, um, listen, I'm organizing Mr. Le UK in October. This was July, like three months, three months apart. Uh, why don't you come and compete? It's in Manchester. And I said, yeah, yeah, I was, I was unsure, but you know, he was so kind. And beginning of October, he messaged me through Facebook and he said, are you competing? I didn't know anything about titles. I mean, I was uh, just a few months into the fetish world after I came from Qatar. Everything was new to me. I was discovering it. I, I just started going out to bars like very, very recently. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to win. You know, they need people. 
I know no one in Manchester. I will go with, with open mind, you know, and I will know Manchester because I have never been to the city. And anyway, so I went to Manchester. I was so nervous that I got drunk on the train because I was like, you know, I was still with, you know, with the last few steps of the depression. I didn't feel good about myself. I was quite shy to get out on a stage and show my body and things like that, yeah? So I was very insecure at the time. So I, I got really drunk. And actually, um, as soon as I arrived to the club, I have to say Manchester has a, an amazing, amazing, amazing fetish scene. They embraced me. Everybody was talking to me. Like nobody knew me, but everybody, they were so welcome. I felt like at home. And then, well, I won the, the title. I won Mr. Lay UK. I can't remember much of the moment because I was so excited. I just remember going back to the hotel on the Sunday morning, having breakfast on, on my own uh, in my hotel in leather, crying, and I just called my family and told them. And they were like, what's that? I'm like, well, I don't know. I will find out <laughs> more or less like this. Let's take a step back and, and look more at that. You had never been to a contest before? No. Fascinating. So tell me what you experienced at the contest. Ooh, my first... My first impression was a little bit like intimidated because I was going into a club. I had been to the Hoys in London before, like a few times, and some other clubs in London, but I used to stay in one corner. You know, I was not brave. Bear in mind, this was when I was uh, 23, 23, 24. But yeah. Okay. Um, so I was really, really, really scared and really like, intimidated by the scene, yeah? I didn't know, do you know when you start that like, you don't know what you're doing, is, if you what you're doing is right or wrong, or you want, you do have all those, uh, you know, dots in your mind. Yeah. So, but but actually like, you know, the contest was so much fun. It was, it was not very, very serious. It was like, you know, everything like, it was kind of like a show. We were five contestants, amazing, all of them. I didn't think I, I would win. But I just showed myself, I guess, you know, I have fun and, and people liked it. I'm curious why they selected someone from Spain for a UK title. You know, um, that's one of the reasons that I didn't think um, I would win. I mean, I lived in the UK at the time, so I lived in the UK for 10 years. It was not a requirement to be from the UK, but to live in the UK. Same, same as uh, a lot of contests like, like ours. The only requirement is, is to live here. And I didn't think I would win because, because of that. I was like, okay, I'm Spanish. You know, all these guys are British. Why will they choose me? Will they choose me? I don't know. I think I was... Uh, because part of me thinks that, and same with, with the Europe contest, because I was on my own, I had to, and I was out of my territory, let's say, the other four guys were from the Manchester area, so they knew people. I had to go out and talk to people and meet people. You know, I was on my own. Mm -hmm. So everybody came to talk to me, and I guess that played the part for them to vote for me because it was audience, uh, the audience voted. Why were you living in the UK then? I was working for an airline. After, after I came back from Qatar, I spent like seven months uh, getting better from the, from the uh, getting well from the depression. And I, I started applying for airlines again. And uh, I started working for TUI, for Thomson Airways okay. in the UK. So I, I moved back to London because I had lived in London before Qatar as well. And it was the easiest way for me, like, you know, working for an airline back in a country that I, that I lived before. Uh, so. See. <laughs> so tell me uh, more about holding the title of Mr. Leather UK. What did you do? What did you learn about it? First of all, my two years, I have to say overall, for me, the biggest benefit was that I learned how to accept myself. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't love myself to the point with, with that is uh, a little bit uh, pretentious. 
but I learned how to accept myself. I think that's that's the key. The other thing I learned is that if you open to people and you speak from your heart, people give that love back to, to you. I feel so, 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 so loved and I'm very, very, very grateful for that from the very beginning. Any regrets about the UK title? I mean, lots of people ask me now, yeah, why, why don't you go for a Robert title? Why don't you go? Even like a few years ago, they, they started asking me. Well, I think people evolve. One, one of those people evolve. I don't think if I, when I consider myself now with what I know now, that, or when I, when someone tells me, should I enter a title? I ask, or I ask them to ask themselves two questions. What can you bring to the title? But also what can the title bring you? Because it has to be two ways. Otherwise the experience is bad. Yeah. This is what I think. Otherwise you feel either uh, burned out or you feel used by people or you feel, you know, if you're not enjoying it, there's no point in, in doing it. You mentioned in the UK title time, you learned a lot about the fetish community. All the work that there is behind creating either contests or uh, socials or charity, you know, raising money, all that was new to me, even then. It was like, wow, it was, it was an eye opening because people think it's just sex. You know, you, you go to, they don't see all the work that is behind, all the volunteers that it takes, all the work that they do for charities, or even, even if it's not raising money, uh, raising information or raising awareness about different topics. Yeah. All that was new to me. And it was great to learn about it. Why did you choose to compete for Mr. Leather Europe? So I went to, to uh, I won Mr. Leather UK first. Yeah, five months after I went to IML. I didn't win. Woody won. Uh, Woody from, from Michigan, or he yes. lived in Michigan mm -hmm. at the time. Big kiss to him and my brothers, which I love them. <laughs> my IML brothers. And then, I mean, my experience, I was still, you know, for me, IML was the end of my depression. When I competed there, it was like, that's it. I won the battle. You know, I was very, very happy. So I just decided to show uh, another side of me at my European contest, you know, because people has, has seen the smiley, outgoing person side of me, but I don't let, still to date, I don't let to see the more private, pervert side of me publicly. I, it, it, is, it is something I, I'm not, in that sort of sense, I'm a very, I'm a very reserved person. You know, I, I do show them my social fetish man, but I don't show them my play, playful fetish man. So I decided to show them the rough side of me. And I did a, a fantasy, more of a dominant top type of, you know, fantasy. <laughs> Which is on YouTube. If everyone wants to watch it, it's Kilker's Fantasy altogether. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to take a step back. You mentioned going to IML. What were your impressions, your thoughts, and feelings about IML? Well, my, my first, I mean, uh, we started, I think it was the second year. Uh, the year before us is the first year when Eric won, Eric, Mr. Lay Europe, that is something like as well, very, very nice guy. They uh, started chatting with each other through Facebook. It's the first year that they had a Facebook group. So we were the second year. So I started chatting with my IML brothers months before uh, um, I was going there. We were all very excited. And when I arrived in Chicago, when I arrived into the hotel, I was actually going with my friend's side. And I didn't see him for four days at all from the moment I stepped into the hotel. All the brothers were waiting for me. My first impression was like, wow, this is huge. What am I doing here? What, what did I get into? This is going to be crazy. But I did feel very, very welcome as well, very embraced. Um, someone from the previous year told me when the contest ended. I mean, I, I didn't understand at the time. Now I do he said, uh, you don't realize, but you're the pet. You're the mascot of your edition. Yeah, and, and 
I was the youngest as well. Uh, so I was, I was very, very nervous, insecure as well, because I didn't know anything about the contest. Of okay. course, I researched a little bit, but I didn't know, you know, I didn't know how to spec. I didn't have as much leather as, as all the others. And my leather as well was not expensive or anything like that. It was just bought from eBay, <laughs> things like this. People think as well, you have to have like a 2,000 euro jacket, amazing leather. No, I, you know, I competed with, with not much stuff, like two trousers, two shirts, uh, one vest. I didn't have that as much. I was new. It doesn't matter. It's showing who you are because you represent me. I represented part of the fetish community like everyone else. Um, I did have a good message to give and, and I still think it was a, a quite, quite a good speech because of what I said. I talk from my heart. You know, to, to the audience. It, my speech was about to... Um, it was about being grateful, not towards me, because okay, you do get you do get kind of like a, a light for a year, you know, a, a, all all the all the eyes and ears are on you, and it's great to represent people and that people listen to you. But what about all these volunteers that never held that title, and probably never will, or they're never interested, you know, the work in the background. What about all these bars that open? Some of them don't, don't make much money, but they're still open so that people have a place, a safe place to enjoy their fetishes. So my speech was a speech to thank them for doing that, to, you know, to, to actually praise those people that we forget and to make people think about, you know, all those people that don't get the attention that title holders do. Now, let's talk about Mr. Leather Europe. Tell me yeah. about that contest and that experience. Wow, it, it was, uh, again, like I said, I, I went there to show another part of myself that people don't usually see so that people got the full picture of Mr. LA UK. Because I didn't think I would win. This would be, that would be my, the end of my year as a title holder, yeah? So I'm like, okay, so as a, you know, the, last time that people is gonna i'm gonna have that attention towards me i'm gonna show them that other side i was held in hamburg by the clubs there very very well organized it was uh, a little bit <laughs> it was a little bit intimidating as well because all the european clubs the european uh european border side now i cannot remember ECMC, ECMC anyway yes yes you European Confederation of Motorcycle Clubs. That's right. They do the an annual general meeting. Yeah, and that's when they, they hold the contest every year in a different city. So that year was in Hamburg. And so all the presidents, vice presidents, all the, let's say, important people meet in the same place and they watch the contest. Very minor, had only been a year or something into the fetish world. So for me, it was like, again, Meeting everyone, meeting lots of people, everything came, you know, we came so, so fast and so quick. My fantasy, I have thought about it just a month before. I had, in my mind, it was very, very clear what I wanted to do. It was the storytelling and we didn't rehearse. Me and, and my, well, my fantasy partner side, we didn't rehearse, we only rehearsed it once. Uh, before the contest. The, the, the music, we did it the same afternoon. I knew which song I wanted. It was very, very clear in my mind, and he did it so well. I'm very, very thankful to him. Tell us about your title year as Mr. Leather Europe. So my title year as Mr. Leather Europe was more, I would say, I mean, Mr. Leather UK was fun, but I was still learning a lot, and I was kind of like, you know, more insecure about the whole thing. Mr. Lay Europe, uh, I was very secure. I knew what I was doing. I knew people as well in every place. So it was easier yeah, for me. Also, uh, because you get invited to so many events and stuff like that, as Mr. Lay Europe, I chose places that I had never been or places where they didn't have Mr. Lay Europe there before, you know? so. 
Um, it was a way for me to, to get that enjoyment as well from the title. So I used the title year to travel to places I wanted to travel. Such as? Like I went to, to San Francisco, I went to Doreal, that I had never been, stuff like that. So, it, so I never got burned out because it was always a new event either that I had never been to or a place where I had never been to. You know, it was, uh, it was so much fun, yeah. What was the most fascinating place you visited? I say what, one of the most beautiful uh, memories that I have, apart from the big, big parties, which, you know, they're always great because you meet so many people. It was Malmo in Sweden. Uh, I have never been to Sweden. And what it was shocking to me is... Because I, I, I don't know, I feel, I feel like a normal person, like just like everyone else. <laughs> but the way they treated me was like, wow, you know, like everything. Since, since I arrived, it was like, you know, I was there, you know, I was up there. But then that was sweet, very, very sweet. It was very cold. It was snowing. And then in the club, one of the most beautiful things they did, they, they, they did a dinner and I was uh, presiding the table. Yeah. So they all suddenly stood up and they started sing, singing to me typical Swedish uh, folklore. Yeah. Oh. Which I, I didn't think how, how to feel. I, I didn't know how to feel, you know. It was like all very, very odd, but very beautiful. Very beautiful to experience. It was kind of like surreal oh. in the fetish club. It was amazing. <laughs> what advice... Can you afford a new contestant trying to do a title? Uh, I wouldn't take it as a second. When, when, when they ask me, like, when someone wins, yeah, in, in, like the next contest or next month, when, when he wins, I always, 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 always ask them something because this is my way of seeing contests yeah, and titles. Okay, you won't say Mr. Robert Spain, yeah? How do you want to take this forward? Because you can either go to other contests like Europe or, or MIR, IML. You can go to win and have uh, one in 50 chance of winning. Or, in my choice, you can go to enjoy and still have that chance. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think when you enjoy it, like I said, when you enjoy it, people enjoy it. So you have more chances of, of winning and and yeah, just be yourself, enjoy, learn, learn a little bit of history. Because for me, one of the things that was fascinating to on my journey to IML, it was uh, learning about how, especially the US scene was uh, before. Yeah, all you know, all those books that that I read, it was it was amazing. You know, everything that the leather archives when when you go and see it there, it's just look. <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing. It's just amazing. I, I, every time I go to Chicago, I visit the archives. It's amazing. Amazing place. What major differences do you see between the American scene and the European scene? Uh, the European scene is more inclined to sex and sex and sex. And the, the uh, U.S. parties are more into the community charity side. Of course, there is sex and there is charity here as well. But I would say that that balance is like this. There's more, you know, more charity work and more community spirit in the U.S. You, there's, it's not even normal here to see like fetish families like you have in the U.S. It was actually, for me, it was shocking. Like 10 years ago, it was shocking learning about all that as well because I had never seen any of that. Now that there is a small part of, you know, uh, the fetish scene in Europe that do have like fetish families, stuff like that, but it's more in the US that you see, you know, all these daddies and sirs and masters and all that was very, very new to me. Okay. <laughs> but you are more in the rubber scene now. Tell us about that. I mean, I have to say, I still enjoy leather. However, one thing that happened to me after the titles which probably because I didn't know as well, now, now I would take things differently, but uh, is that I went to so many events in such a short time that it, I, it's not that I don't enjoy it, it just became normal. Like now I will go like this 
uh, to the street. I have a meeting afterwards. It's just that it doesn't have that kind of like forbidden feeling, you know, that steel rubber gives me, you know, when I go into rubber on the subway, it still gives me that, I like to give that that image to people. They, they look at you like you pair, right? Leather be, just became normal. I know it's in our minds anyway. Fet- fetish is a state of mind. When we were preparing for this interview, you indicated you're doing more activities in the community now than when you were a title holder. So what are you doing in the community now? First of all, I like to say that people think that uh, in your title years, you have to do something. For me, your title years are for you, yeah, to bring something into the community, yeah, but to enjoy and, and to meet people, make connections, stuff like that. The real work starts start after your title or titles. Yes, yeah, so I, in my, in my two years of title holding, first of all, you don't have much time. Yeah. You know, you have your normal life, like work and stuff like that. Weekends, it was just parties, after parties. And so I don't know how people take the time of, of, of doing it. There's some people that in their title years have found a way and they've done amazing things. But most of the people do the hard work afterwards. And that's, for me, when you're, or at least in my, in my case, when your fetish life starts, yeah? So for years, I, um, I've been doing modeling uh, for some brands, which was something that came to me as well as a chance and I couldn't believe it <laughs> because I never saw myself doing something like this. And, and I love it. And then when I moved, especially when I moved to Barcelona, I mean, I did, uh, I hosted and helped to, to organize the first Mr. Leather Spains like a few years ago. Okay. Uh, I was vice president of, of Leather France Spain, which is the club that um, hosts this title. And then I'm concentrated in uh, the Barcelona Rubber Group. We organize Mr. Rubber Spain, the rubber weekends here, and we help create different rubber clubs uh, in Spain, like Madrid Rubberman, and try to help others as well, you know, to create the scene in their respective communities. I mean, Madrid is uh, now with the fast train that we have in, in Europe, it's two hours away by train or one hour away by plane. I think so. 100 miles away, something like 700 kilometers uh, from here. So, you know, for, I mean, people travel to these events, but if you want to do something more occasional, you have to create your own group then. So, we help them to create their own group. Uh, there's other groups from Barcelona have created groups in, in and around Spain as well, like the Seville guys or Torremolinos, the San Madrid Letterman as well. So, yeah. What is the biggest misconception about you? Well, but this is where I think I, people don't think that I am actually shy, but I am in a, you know, when, when it, it comes to like connections, yeah. Uh, I'm very, very good. I mean, flight attendants, we're very, very good at pretending. So I can appear to be very sure and very confident, but inside, some, in some situations, I'm buying inside. Yeah. I mean, a good thing is that I don't take myself very, very seriously. So <laughs> I, make, I make a fool of myself so often because I'm very, very classy and very, you know, but I laugh at myself. So, you know, but I, and I, I am very, very, not insecure, but very kind of like a uh, yeah, shy person inside. <laughs> I would say that one. People will disagree. I'm really sure. Well, Kilker Alcaraz, I have to thank you for an amazing interview today. You have made my job easy today. Oh, uh, you know, it's been, it's been very, very nice. And I hope people enjoy it.